Has anyone else seen these 90s video game mixtapes circulating on YouTube? I've been playing them in the car for the last few weeks and it's turned into a bit of an obsession. If you grew up with games like Wipeout, Tekken, Gran Turismo and Street Fighter in the 90s, you'd already had your first nightclub experience, you were just too young to realise it. Jungle and drum and bass subgenres like Atmospheric, Ambient, Intelligent, Liquid, Jazz Step were all over these game soundtracks and I think they absolutely slap. So I thought I'd talk about where this music came from, its roots in British and Jamaican culture, a bass heavy sound that left a lasting legacy on the gaming industry, dopamine inducing dance floor tracks that sit perfectly beneath the low poly action of racing, aerial combat, fighting, action adventure and puzzles in 90s video games. This UK sound that peaked when the next generation of home consoles were able to use CD quality audio in their game soundtracks. A coming together of technology and culture that is gone but certainly not forgotten. Music in the 1980s was unlike any other decade. In 1988, Artists like Pet Shop Boys, Dire Straits, Prince, Morrissey, Phil Collins were scoring hits throughout that year. Neighbours stars Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan had just taken over the top five in the UK. Hip-hop was making waves over the pond, but beneath the chart-topping artists, a shift was occurring in the underground. Disco had evolved since the late 70s, as Chicago and Detroit DJs led the way with house music. House music at that time, it was anything that Frankie Knuckles would play at the warehouse. How hot is house music now? It's uh, hot. It's yeah. real hot, especially in England. It, you know, it, it's really taking off. It's like a stream of Chicago artists going from here to England. By the late 80s, the sound was becoming increasingly corrosive as Trax Records established their dance floor dominance with a stream of timeless releases. DJ Pierre's Box Energy and Future's Acid Tracks were the first to adopt a new sound. The term acid was attributed to a particular synthesizer that had a certain acidic sound. The 303 was initially designed to replicate a bass guitar, but due to its unrealistic sound, it was dismissed by producers upon its release in 1984. That was until artists like Future began experimenting with them, discovering their unique potential as the missing ingredient of house music. The ability to alter the 303's filters during a sequence created a hypnotic, evolving feel that worked perfectly with an 808 or a 909 drum machine. And that was, that was the birth of acid right there. The Acid House sound began to spread to the UK, where it would soon create a cultural movement. Acid House music hit the charts in Great Britain, and kids were flocking to record stores to purchase the new sound that was creating a frenzy throughout the country. The arrival of Acid House in the UK triggered a social phenomenon that became the second Summer of Love, a British sequel to the American Summer of Love of 1967. Like the first Summer of Love, psychedelic drugs were prevalent. What is drugs? But it was the music that people longed for. It started with groups of young people flocking to large social gatherings to celebrate this new music, which then evolved into huge raves across the country. These illegal gatherings were announced via pirate radio stations in a cryptic manner, keeping the events hidden from the police. Acid was continuing to change with the turn of the decade. Pirate radio stations like Cool FM, Kiss and Rinse FM were sharing a new underground music with links to the Windrush culture. House began to feature more breakbeat samples from early funk, disco and R&B records. One of these records was We Are E by Lenny D. Ice in 1989, becoming a favourite for two young DJs who are considered to be pioneers of jungle and drum and bass, Fabio and Groove Rider. The South London duo began DJing at illegal raves and warehouse parties in the mid-1980s. They also played on pirate radio station Phase One in Brixton. Throughout their DJ sets, Fabio and Groove Rider would discover Jungle at one of London's largest parties, Rage at Heaven. The influence, the impact that that club had for culture, forget drum and bass for a second, just for culture. And of course, Fabio and Groove Rider championed this new sound that was coming out of rave culture. They soon found themselves playing weekly sets at the club's second room 
room, where their sets caused an overflow of revelers. Their record selections were a unique blend of hip-hop, house and techno, speeding up breakbeat and hip-hop records to the tempo of techno and house music. This had a noticeable effect on audiences, and as a result, they were promoted to the main room at Rage. It's the place that I think the jungle was kind of formed in the way that we used to play breakbeats on top of techno. I can actually tell you about the birth of jungle. I used to speed the breakbeats up to 45 to try and mix them with house music and we were making a new music. We noticed when we did that, you know, we got a vibe and, and, and people were dancing in a different way from the normal four to four house. It kind of went beyond rave then because it became like the darker side of London underground. That's the, the difference with what rage did. You know, when you talk about jungle, I'm talking before people got on the mic with a spinning ragger, I'm talking urban jungle. It's Fabio coined that name. It's Fabio I heard the first person say the name jungle. A guy called Gerald remembers how this faster breakbeat style took him and his Manchester friends by surprise. I was booked to do a live PA at this rave in the Midlands. I think it was Groove Rider who was playing before me. Anyways, we were playing these really fast breakbeats and the kids were just going mad. Tracks started coming out like RIE, Champion Sounds, a lot of the early jungle stuff from my B for records, Living Dream Records, Moving Shadow, Suburban Bass, and then it became a movement. And then jungle was kind of formed. You heard bass lines, what I recognised from reggae tunes. And that drew in other people, especially black working class people. It's a convergence of all kinds of music. Combines the bass of dub with the breaks of beats, with the synthesizers of techno. Jungle's inception at the Rage was the beginning of a new genre of electronic music that was championed by the young ethnic minorities of South London. Bass lines were heavy Jamaican subs that shook the earth. Vintage breakbeat drums sampled from predominantly black funk, R&B and disco records programmed with precision at twice their original speed. Then there's the synthesizers, soft pads, busy arpeggios and space age melodies inspired by the house and techno records from Chicago and Detroit. Finally, the sampling, which was being taken further artistically than ever before, as producers sampled ambiences, dialogue, discordant strings, and haunting refrains from movies and television. Fucking voodoo magic man. <laughs> says always tell your mummy before you go off somewhere. Charlie says always tell your mummy. <laughs> out of my body I was slightly frightened I felt that I was in this long dark tunnel with the blueprint in place, the scene took Jungle to new places. The sound had morphed into a grittier, darker experience. Dark came from the feeling of breakdown in society. It was winter, pubs were closing, the country was in decline. As an artist, I had to reflect it. The vibe of Jungle is dark because it's dark goings on right now out there. They're being oppressed by a system and by bad policing and by bad community help and bad housing, which is the main thing which has caused the problem. Subsequent releases explored sampling further, with Dart becoming a trend throughout 92 and 93. Mark Clare and Dago McFarlane of 4Hero and Reinforced Records would make their contribution to the Dart core sound with their EP, Journey from the Light. Their Dollis Hill studio became a place for sonic experimentation, with Goldie shadowing their every move. I work with Dago in the morning, and I work with Mark in Reinforced in the evening. And people don't understand, as a DNA is concerned, that was the light and darker my music, because Mark was darker, Ego was lighter. So why would have these tunes that were crossbred? Mark and Dago McFarlane gave a lot to the Jungleist movement, not just alongside Goldie. Their label Reinforced was probably the top label in the scene. Mark and Dago also released classic jungle tracks from their other label, Tom and Jerry. Despite being a side project, many of their tracks turned out to be well-known anthems across the scene. Anyone who was raving at the time would remember Maximum Style or Air Freshener. At the end of 1992, Goldie released Terminator, where he applied a production technique called time stretching to his music. His pivotal moment came with Terminator. What was different about it was Goldie used time stretching for the first time ever. One of my favorite memories is the first time they played Terminator here, do you know what I mean? Watching Goldie just run around like a complete madman. The innovations of this track did a lot for the genre. He used a harmonizer to alter the pitch of breakbeats and samples to create a new flavor of jungle. There was a lot of equipment in the studio and I'd seen a HF harmonizer. If I put breakbeat through that, 
No. I don't know. No one's ever done it. <laughs> Let's wire it up. You're talking about things that I haven't done yet. And it was just like the most, it was like every hair on every follicle on my entire body just stood up and it was like, what the hell are we just done? Over the summer, as many as 20,000 people were raving to jungle every weekend. In London, major West End clubs now feature jungle. Even Radio 1 began to play. 1994 was the year of jungle. Well, in terms of commercial popularity, at least. Having previously been confined to pirate radio, legal stations woke up to jungle in 94. A series of CD compilations such as Jungle Mania and Jungle Hits flew off the shelves as Jungle's Windrush roots continued to evolve and blossom. Pirate Radio continued to be an important source of promotion for record sales. Pirates had all the freshest new tunes, the power of influence, and were capable of playing tracks as soon as they dropped, unlike legal stations that were months behind. Pirate Radio was fundamental in creating community. That's how it spread like wildfire. KISS FM became the first commercial station to air a weekly jungle show. This was so exciting for listeners that they would write in by the sackful, requesting dates and times of the shows. Head of specialist programs at KISS remembers hiring Fabio and Groove Rider onto the rotation. We got Fabio and Groove Rider in. Initially, the idea was to get LTJ Bookham for Friday, but I just thought it would cause too much friction with the other DJs. It would have caused a lot of bickering, so I looked towards the people that everyone called the originators, Fabio and Groove. They were the best choice in the end anyway, not only because the scene was happy, but also because they were playing the wildest style of music. In October of 1994, UK Apache released Original Nutter, reaching 39th in the national charts, pushing Jungle further into the public eye. The rising coverage of Jungle on MTV and KISS meant that this new sound could no longer be recognised as an underground movement. This music was about to blow up, MTV got involved, they picked up the music, they started showing videos, people like Adam F was being on MTV, there was people like DJ Rap was being rotated, Groove Rider, and Fabio was on Radio 1. The thing was starting to really, you know, take life. Soon after Original Nutter, MB and General Levy released Incredible. Now we've got MB and General Levy, first jungle on top of the pops ever. Yo, Maddie Walla, they must spin them like a windmill. The success of Incredible saw it hit the top 10, keeping its place within the top 75 for 12 weeks igniting a mainstream interest in Jungle, with the media calling 1994 the Summer of Jungle. Bursting into the public eye on the back of General Levy's incredible, Jungle is a new sound of the year. Jungle is in many ways Britain's answer to America's hip-hop music. The release of Incredible and the 1994 Notting Hill Carnival had magazines hungry for stories surrounding this quote-unquote new scene. The independent newspaper described it as, to music what Mortal Kombat is to video games aggressive, violent, and totally compulsive. Underneath the hype of Ragga Jungle, a smoother, more textural form of jungle was forming, one that spliced a membranes with ethereal ambiences, cool jazziness, and soulful twists. A new subgenre is recognized largely by the works of LTJ Bookham, who grew tired of dark and wanted to carve out a new sound that had more depth and complexity. This shift in tonality was also happening for Dago McFarlane and Mark Clare of Four Hero, who released Parallel Universe, recognized today as a cult classic album. It was a fusion of breakbeats, elusive synthesizers, string movements and experimental sampling with a heavy dose of soul and jazz fusion. Critic Tim Barr described it as a triumph of breakbeat science, from the supernova lover's rock of universal love to the compelling percussive ballet of solar emissions. This is the record which took drum and bass into out of space. Parallel Universe not only revealed the potential offered by the artist-led drum and bass album, but it also revealed the scene's fascination for jazz. In 1993, Ronnie Size was caught embracing this sound with Music Box on his full cycle label. In 1994, Size continued to include jazz elements, 
with It's a Jazz Thing and Brown Paper Bag on his superb 97 release, New Forms. A student of jazz, Daniel Williamson, aka LTJ Bookham, was an accomplished pianist. He initially began playing in jazz funk groups, progressing onto the turntables with a record collection of rare jazz funk and house music. Bookham had spun records at some of the earliest raves alongside Fabio and Groove Rider. His first release, Delightful, wasn't quite up to standard. However, Bookham would return in force with the aptly named Logical Progression. Williamson told Music's Calvin Bush in 1995, I called my first tune Logical Progression because that's what it was. It was time for music to move on. I couldn't get the kind of music I wanted to play out, so I ended up making new tunes from finding beats and mixing them in with house and vice versa. It was the same when I made Demon's Theme in 1992. The music was dark then, dark full stop. I've been trying to get away from it, mixing it in with other stuff which was nicer. And he did just that in 1993. Book and Wood depart from dark with a track called Music, a hypnotic evolving looping of chords and deep bass lines, swung in rhythmical interplay with an amen break cut with precision and groove the lighter oceanic tonality was a breath of fresh air and is also where we begin to hear the musical influence on video game composers of the 90s bookham would later release the brilliant compilation series logical progressions one through four the compilation brings together the music of 17 artists in a brilliantly cohesive package as well as some of his best tracks music horizons demon's theme and cooling out a collective effort from him and his members at good looking records mix mag stated in a review that the mix works as a kind of propulsive chill out it's soft curves and airy chords not a million miles away from Brian Eno's vision for ambient as a musical genre that allowed both total immersion and distracted half listening. Rob Hayes alias Omnitrio provided a series of releases with his own interpretation of intelligent through his label Moving Shadow Records. Tracks like Mystic Stepper and Renegade Snares, the latter would make it onto Grand Theft Auto's Liberty City soundtrack and Midnight Club 3. Omnitrio can also be heard on Roll Cage Stage 2 with two bass driven tracks, Penetration and Secret Life. The music industry and the video game industry were becoming two sides of the same coin as the sound of jungle and drum and bass appeared in many of the video game soundtracks from the new generations of consoles, most notably the new 32-bit system from Sony, the PlayStation. The PlayStation's superiority was evident the moment you turned it on. Released a few weeks after the Sega Saturn, it undercut Nintendo on price and sold over 100 million units, completely surpassing its rivals. You're probably wondering what a bit means. A bit is a binary digit. Nintendo's hugely popular NES system used 8-bit audio and graphics. 8-bit graphics allowed a maximum of 256 colors that can be displayed, whereas 16-bit graphics could produce 65,536 colors, and obviously this improves with the higher the bit rate. The same applies to audio. 8-bit sound uses only 256 possible values to represent each music sample. The higher the bit rate, the better the quality and the dynamic range of the audio. Just listen to the differences. So the 16, 32, 64 and 128 bit consoles allowed developers to design and compose music and sound effects that were more detailed and complex. The PlayStation was the first to produce thrilling three dimensional gaming experiences with 32 bit audio during the height of Jungle's popularity. Each console had their own outstanding titles with brilliant soundtracks influenced by the evolution of Jungle and drum and bass. So let's discuss some of the soundtracks, starting off with a personal favorite of mine from the Japanese producer, Tet Tsukazu Nakanishi cannot go unmentioned for his contributions to the catalogues of music produced for the numerous titles throughout his career, in particular the soundtracks to Ridge Racer, Ace Combat and the Tekken series. The first Ridge Racer soundtrack was heavily raid influenced with tracks that would beat you senseless with their repetitive beats and crazy rhythms. <laughs> Yeah! 
Rage Racer, produced and composed by Nakanishi and Hiroshi Okubo during the summer of 1996, consisted mostly of 90s electronica and drum and bass, which was a slight departure from the Euro dance club styles of the early Ridge Racer games. Nakanishi followed up Rage Racer with one of the best game soundtracks on the PS1, Ridge Racer Type 4. Nakanishi also explored jungle and drum and bass in Ace Combat and Cloana, Daughter Phantom Isle. Next is another Japanese masterclass from Soichi Tarada, best known for his pioneering work as a producer and DJ of Japanese house and jungle music, and is regarded as one of the most influential producers in the scene. Tarada also founded the record label Far East Recordings in 1989, often collaborating with Shinichiro Yokota. Tarada's career gained traction when Larry Levan remixed Tarada's Sun Shower in 1991. However, Tarada became enamoured by the excitement and sub-bass pressure of Jungle. In a Vice interview, he stated that in 1995, he was addicted to drum and bass. He says, It was so fun to experience the sub-bass sound in a club. I love to go to the drum and bass parties much more than the house events in the late 90s. I had a drum and bass disease, personally. He went on to produce an album by the name of Sumo Jungle, sampling sumo fights, utilising the huffs, smacks, gongs, and chants into his own style of drum and bass. Tarada's crisp, atmospheric, jazzy breakbeats caught the attention of game developers and Tarada's talents were put to good use on Wang and Trial and then most notably, Ape Escape. Ape Escape soundtrack is a complete joy from start to finish. There's house, there's synths and perhaps the most successful use of jungle and breaks in a children's computer game. Wipeout series represents the impact of licensed music on early gaming titles. The series features tracks from techno, drum and bass and electronic and acid producers, as well as some brilliant productions from Welsh composer Tim Wright, under the alias Cold Storage. Wright's contributions were popular with players, setting the bar high for subsequent titles. Wipeout co-creator Nick Burkham explained that the choice of genres was based on an experience he had while playing Super Mario Kart. He had just finished in first place, but had The Age of Love playing instead of the game's soundtrack, and thought that it fitted the moment better. He initially reached out to the Prodigy, but had no luck. Then he turned to Orbital, who would produce Wipeout Petrol, and then Leftfield responded with Afro Ride, 
And finally, Chemical Brothers with Chemical Beats. Burkham stated in a Eurogamer interview that Wipeout 2097 had the biggest impact. That was the one that was most culturally relevant. That was the one I felt most proud of. The team did an amazing job on it. The whole product was made in seven or eight months. It was amazing. It was something fresh on the market. This tying together of club culture and gaming. People say it made gaming cool and acceptable in a different field. Subsequent Wipeout games continue to include electronic producers, Chemical Brothers, Future Sound of London, Underworld, Fluke, Prodigy and Daft Punk all made their appearances. Another welcome addition to these jungle and drum and bass mixes is the music of Juj Kuma on her work for the 1998 N64 release, Bomber Man Hero. The soundtrack has a similar quirky playfulness and cutting edge production value as Soichi Tarada's Ape Escape, 909 drum machines, Amen Breaks and intergalactic synths create an unforgettable gaming experience. When I think of music and Formula One, I immediately think of The Chain by Fleetwood Mac or Black Betty by Ram Jam or Freebird by Leonard Skinner. With that said, this soundtrack has some really nice intelligent and atmospheric productions from Martin Tutasta. Each track accompanies a different circuit on the F1 calendar. Many of them have deep, silky, smooth synths, great beats and sub-bass rhythms that remind me of LTJ Bookham and 4 Hero. Right, so that is what I'm listening to in the car at the moment. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, I have to give a special shout out to Martin James, the author of State of Bass. This book pretty much chronicles how Jungle turned into drum and bass from Acid House. Um, it's a wicked book. It pretty much informed everything that you saw in this video. Which soundtrack do you think slapped the most? Let me know in the comment section and I will see you when you are older. The game's over.